Have you ever thought about a career in the whiskey industry? I'm not talking about being the next master distiller, but if you want a leg up on the competition, you need to take a look at the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. This six-course program will prepare you for the business side of the spirits industry, like finance, marketing, and operations. This is 100% online, meaning that you can access the classes at any time and anywhere. So what are you waiting for? All that's required is a bachelor's degree. Go to uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. Well, at that time, barrels were worth virtually nothing. So <laughs> when they dumped them, they would just pile them up pyramid style on their property. Of course, riding around with the bicycle, I was inquisitive and I would venture in to see what I could find. And sometimes I would find a sip here or there that was left in the barrel so how are those bike rides home a little wobbly <laughs> uh, some of them i remember some i don't <laughs> all right this is episode 239 of bourbon pursuit i'm kenny one of your hosts and here's your bourbon weekly news roundup In 2019, the TTB approved 180,400 products. That's quite the amount of work. This is a 4.5% increase over 2018, with wine being the largest at 123,000, beer having 41,300, and spirits at 16,100. And now we know why they're always so busy. Recent polls suggest that over 5 million adults follow a vegan diet in the United States alone. Vegan diets exclude all animal products, including meat, dairy, eggs, and honey, and most of them also eliminate any byproducts that derive from animals or insects, including ones used during food processing. So the question really is, is bourbon vegan? Healthline.com investigated alcohol and if it's vegan or not, since manufacturers aren't usually required to list ingredients on their beer, wine, and spirits. So what is not vegan? Well, that's dairy products that are added to things like beer and liqueurs to give a creamy or rich texture. These are things like bourbon cream that everyone is starting to crank out. Other non-vegan options are things like honey, eggs, isinglass, which is a fining agent derived from fish bladders, gelatin, cochineal, and carmine, which is a red dye made from the scales of insects used for red coloring. So by and large, bourbon is vegan. Angel's Envy has announced the second release in their cellar collection, a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey finished in tawny port wine barrels. I had the opportunity to join Wes and Kyle Henderson during the media preview day. Next month, the distillery is releasing their tawny port wine finished bourbon, and this whiskey began with a 10-year-old straight Kentucky bourbon whiskey that was then finished for 10 months in tawny port wine barrels. They added just a little bit of water before it was bottled to end up at 111.6 proof. Now, being 10 years old, the color is significantly darker than their standard offering and has a different taste profile as well. There will only be 5,400 bottles released, and the purchases will be able to begin on February 8th at select retailers in the states of Kentucky, California, Florida, Illinois, New York, and Tennessee, as well as at Angels MV Distillery downtown Louisville, and has a suggested retail price of around $249.99. Members of Angels Envy's 500 Main were also given the first option to purchase bottles, and you can look forward to hearing our review on an upcoming Whiskey Quickie. Our good friend Blake from Bourboner.com has released his Jim Beam Production Cheat Sheet. It is an easy way to start digesting the Jim Beam mash bills, their proof coming off the still, and what proof they go into the barrel. So you can see things like Old Granddad, Basil Hayden, and how they all stack up and how they're all a little bit different. There's more unanswered questions as to where the barrels are placed in the warehouses, but this is going to be a great reference, and you can get the link to the cheat sheet in our show notes. Last week, we ventured out to Old Forester to pick a barrel for our Patreon community. This was our first time coming there, and now we're looking forward to doing even more when that barrel strength and 100 proof options start kicking in around the May timeframe. If you want to read more about our experience, Go to patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit and you can check the public post to read our recap. You can also look at our spreadsheet for where you can see all the barrel picks that we have coming up to schedule in 2020. Today in the show, we talk to one of the biggest and upcoming distilleries in Bardstown, and that's the Bardstown Bourbon Company. We featured the business side on the podcast previously, 
and though they're doing a bunch of contract distilling but also launching their own brands. However, this time we look at the operations side and you get to hear from two of the guys that are responsible for filling thousands of barrels per year. Steve Nally and John Hargrove sit down with us to talk about their background in distillation. And spoiler alert, Steve Nally is kind of a big deal, but we also touch on what the process is like for a customer to work with them, how they choose a mash bill, choosing a yeast strain, where the barrels are gonna start being aged in brick houses, where do you get to choose them, and where they both see the market of bourbon in five years down the road. I should also mention that if you're on the bourbon trail, you need to stop at the Bardstown Bourbon Company for lunch and a dusty pour. All right, it's that time again. Let's go hear from our friend Joe over Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with the Buff the Char. Hey everyone, Joe here again. We work with distilleries from all over the world to source and blend the best ingredients into America's most curious cask strength whiskeys. Use the store locator at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. When I wrote my book, Bourbon, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Whiskey, I found most of my records through old government testimony and treasury transcripts and all sorts of hearings in the Senate and Congress. And that's how I basically formed the history of bourbon, or at least my interpretation of the history of bourbon. I didn't necessarily listen to distillers. Sure, I quoted distillers and I included their stories, but to me, the real story of whiskey has always been around the governments because the governments are the ones who choose to define them. They're the ones who kind of like uh, tax them and push them to go into one proof or another. You know, to me, the government system of the world dictates what we drink. And we have another incredible story to tell. Bolivia and the United States just entered into an agreement to recognize bourbon and Tennessee whiskey as unique American products, as long as America recognizes Singani, which is a unique to them um, brandy made from muscat grapes, mostly in the Andes Mountains, uh, you know, but about 5,000 feet or 9,200 feet above, you know, sea level. So as long as we recognize their brandy, they'll recognize our bourbon as unique to our respective countries. Now, you can look at this and say, wow, this is, uh, this is something that they should already be doing. And for the most part, look, they, they are. No, one's out, no one in Bolivia is, is you know, hucking up corn and mashing it and fermenting it and distilling it and then putting it in a barrel. They're, they're not doing that, and they're not trying to call it bourbon. And if they are, they I mean, they have the audience of probably their small township. Really, this was about Bolivia getting the opportunity to stand out on the world stage to talk about their brandy. And bourbon helped bring that to the stage, because if, if Bolivia had entered this uh, agreement with China over Baju, to have a, a, a joint recognition of like what their particular spirits are, nobody would care. But because they did this with the United States of America and they chose to honor and respect the codes and uh, systems of bourbon, the whole world knows about Singani now. And I can't wait to go find a bottle, pour myself some, and celebrate this historic moment in American whiskey history. Well, the bad news is I'm probably going to have to go to Bolivia, but I'm going to go look at uh, Expedia right now for two tickets to Bolivia. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, my website, fredminnick.com, wherever. Just hit me up. I love your ideas. I listen to them, and I often record them because I frequently run out of ideas. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan here today. Um, as you probably hear, uh, we're not in a recording studio, per nope. se. We're in our mobile recording studio uh, at the Bottled and Bond Kitchen here at the Birdstown Bourbon Company. Yes, we had full bellies and uh, had some great cocktails. I think they were trying to get us to take a nap so they could get out of this podcast. What did you, uh, you have for lunch? Man, we had some great prosciutto some cured meats some cheese some bread and then we had brussels sprouts I had the 
fish tacos, had a gin cocktail, mm -hmm. had a little sip of a carrot and bourbon cocktail, a barrel aged fat. Not, I didn't drink them all myself. But, uh, <laughs> they were uh, maybe, 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 but uh, yeah. Shout out to Dan for uh, for hooking us up with the cocktails too, because that was uh, it's quite the experience here. And, I, and you yeah. know, we've we've talked about uh, Bottle and Bond Kitchen and, and really what it is here because it's it's a really an elevated experience here at. Bartstown Bourbon Company, yeah. and even for Bartstown in itself. Yeah, I think it's just a true representation of the brand and the company. Like they're innovators, and like they they really have me excited about the future of bourbon. Because when we met John at Bourbon Beyond Tent, you know, like you just you can just tell these guys get it, like who the new bourbon consumers are, what they want. They're doing some really cool stuff. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited about the future of this company, and like, and they're they're killing it right now. They're absolutely, great, so. and and hopefully, you know, after all that meal, we don't want to take a nap on ourselves <laughs> yep. and uh you know well hell they they doubled up yeah, they, they went and got more drinks yeah, our, our guests <laughs> our guests showed up they're like well, well you know it's it's past noon now i guess we can get ourselves yeah. another cocktail don draper lunch <laughs> <you know. laughs> so yeah so if you do hear some background noise that is because uh we are around uh probably around 150 people that are eating lunch here as well so you get to uh, you get to experience that and hopefully you're not getting a hungry stomach as you're driving down the road or however you're listening to this podcast. But let's go ahead and introduce our guest today. So today on the show, we are talking about the operations side of the Barstown Bourbon Company. So we have Steve Nally, the master distiller from Barstown Bourbon Company, as well as John Hargrove, the VP of Manufacturing Operations. So fellas, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I mean, we're excited to have you all here, uh, A, because, you know, we're excited to have us here. I absolutely. Think. I mean, Likewise, we, we are. It, you know, Ryan, I was doing some brainstorming this morning and I was thinking about, you know, the first time we talked about Barstown Perfect Company on the podcast was back on episode 19 when we had Dave Mandel on. I mean, 19 was hundreds of episodes ago. So we're years beyond that. And we were kind of reminiscing and thinking about like, you know, this was before like ground was breaking and all this other kind of stuff. So it's, it's, yeah, it's cool at, to finally see At that see point it was just fruition. kind of a vision. It was more of a dream and now you've kind of seen it come to fruition and the execution of it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So, be, but until we start talking about, you know, the, the operation side and really what goes into it, we want to know more about the people here. So, um, Steve, I'm going to look at you because, you know, we had talked earlier when you're kind of showing us around here and the size and the scale of things. But, you know, you had mentioned that, you know, you grew up in Loretto. Like, well, that's that's sort of your home around Maker's Mark area. Kind of talk about, um, do you remember, was, was Maker's Mark your, your first taste of bourbon? It was, and <laughs> that's an interesting story. You know, I was uh, riding bicycles up and down beside a Maker's Mark property when I was a youngster. Uh, and occasionally a barrel would have a little product in it that I might sneak a, a sip of. So, yes, it was my first taste. Wait, wait. So they're just barrels like on the side of the road? Is that how it was? Well, at that time, barrels were worth virtually nothing. So when they <laughs> dumped them, they would just pile them up pyramid style on their property. Of course, riding around the bicycle, I was inquisitive and I would venture in to see what I could find. And sometimes I would find a sip here or there that was left in the barrel so how are those bike rides home a little wobbly <laughs> uh some of them i remember some i don't <laughs> that's that's quite the story yeah you're not going to find that with uh bourbon barrels nowadays it's, it just seems like it's uh it's well i mean a it's a market where people are or we were actually talking about this at lunch about an average uh barrel is around 80 dollars on used barrels on the uh, on the average on the market so um, being able to uh, squeeze some extra product out of it is probably even even more impossible now because they do things of, uh, you know, A, there's ways that you can dump it, but I've also seen places that they sort of like vacuum out the product from the barrels now too. And they also rinse them too. You know, they were rinsed to get all the product they can out of it. Mm -hmm. Get that devil's cut. No, the, the devil's that is, cut out. Yeah. That's correct. Exactly. And so yeah. we got Steve's story to intro to bourbon. John, what about yours? Mine's not such a storybook uh, beginning, <laughs> uh, but prior to me getting into the spirits industry, I worked for PepsiCo, and then um, working at Barton 1792 brought me into the spirits industry. So I moved from Missouri to Kentucky um, as a uh, lead over some of their bottling items on the efficiency side, and then worked my way over to the distillery um, over director of operations, distillation operations, and then master distiller at Barton 1792. And then I got a call one day from uh, a David Mandel, as we all know here, and two years later, uh, here I am sitting talking with you he's, guys. He's not a good salesman or anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I beg to differ. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's good to kind of know about your past. And, and Steve, I kind of want to like talk about that some more about, because you, you have a, you have a storied history. Um, you know, you were uh, the master distiller at Maker's Mark for how many years? 15 years. 15 years. Um, kind of, kind of talk about like what got you into the spirits business. It was actually coincidental that, you know, I grew up beside of Maker's Mark and when I graduated from high school, I thought I wanted to go into farming as a as a career, and I soon found out that was a bad choice, you know, <laughs> to say the least. So a lot of, a lot of I, early mornings and early mornings, long hours, no pay. Yeah, uh, you know, I went down to Maker's Mark just looking for a job primarily, and it just happened they they had an opening. I uh, hired on, and I worked down there for the first 16, 17 years doing every job down there. You know, I actually went from maintenance, night watchman, uh, distillery operator, warehouse, and everything down there I actually performed. In 1988, uh, I became master distiller. So I was master distiller for the last 15 years I was down there. Uh, learned every part of the operation. I mean, you know, I had some, I call them pioneers of the industry that I learned from. You know, they uh, knew the business inside and out. They knew exactly how things should be done. So, you know, I was able to learn. Uh, Semi-retired from Maker's Mark, had the opportunity to go to Wyoming. Uh, built Wyoming whiskey, got it up and going, product on the market. I was out there for six and a half years. And during that time, I was inducted into the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame, uh, which was a great honor. And then the opportunity, while in Wyoming, of all while in Wyoming, <laughs> uh, the opportunity came in 2013 to come back to Barstown to do Barstown Bourbon. So I actually came on board before they purchased the property, mm -hmm. and I helped to lay out the production facility and get that all up and going. So, Talk it, of, what was that first job at Makers? Did you say you had? I actually went in growing yeast. I was a yeast uh, yeast person. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't know that was a job. Yeah, a yeast, yeast person. person yeast person is actually a ye growing yeast is actually a separate operation from the distillery. You know, it's actually keeping the culture of yeast viable, sterile. You know, and every part of it. So I started out in that part of it. And to Steve, see, he's being um, pretty humble right pretty now. Pretty humble right now. Uh, a yeast person propagation. Uh, is such an important part of the process and one of the more difficult parts of the process. Uh, so here at Bar Sound Bourbon, we actually um, leave it to the pros as far as hand, uh, making our yeast and delivering it to us as we just utilize it. So we do not propagate uh, our own yeast here, but uh, just uh, Steve's being humble. That's probably, if Steve started out in a yeast, uh, propagating yeast, uh, the rest is history from there. Because if you can do that, <laughs> you, can do uh, anything. You, you see why he was master distiller for 15 years at Maker's Mark. Yeah. Well, to elaborate on that just a little bit, Maker's Mark started in 1953 with the culture of yeast. They still have that same culture today. So it's propagating, keeping it viable. And allegedly, it's stuff. like the Stitzel Weller yeast or something, right? It's something, right? exactly the same, same yeah. line. Yeah. So, you know, it's... It's not just growing it, it's keeping it sterile and viable and keeping the, the foreign yeast or the wild it's yeast It's kind of like this moss wall. You know, you don't touch it. You know, it's very sensitive. <laughs> you don't touch Only it. qualified <laughs> hands are allowed to touch this moss wall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty amazing because, A, I didn't know there was a yeast person that even existed at Maker's Mark at this time. But it sounds like you didn't screw up too much because if they're still using the same yeast today, then you did your job. I hope so. I mean, you know, it, it would have been my neck if I hadn't have. So talk about some, like, at Makers, out. you know, they preach, like, everything's consistent. You know, we want consistency. Let's do everything the same. Just don't screw it up. Talk about going from that environment to, like, startups with, like, Wyoming and Barstow Bourbon. Like, was that, how, contrast the two for me. I think uh, Makers Mark gave me the basis to be able to do Wyoming whiskey because I actually had performed every job down there. So you get the basis and then you have an idea of how to pursue, uh, you know, from some great teachers that you do this, you don't do something that that's going to cause you issues down the road. And, you know, when you set up a facility, I always kind of look at like the operator's point of view, you know, what makes it easier for the operator to do but also what makes a, a better product come out to keep uh, keep it sterile, to keep it sanitary, to keep it you know clean, and to make it easier for the operator to perform his job. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. There's a lot going on there, that's for sure. And so you you touched every every piece of equipment, and then you knew everything back and forth there at Makers then. Yes, I mean, I'd actually been from, like I said, yeast, maintenance, warehousing, bottling, uh, shipping clerk, master distiller, all the way from one end to the other. What, what was the... So I mean, I'm imagining that you like the master distiller role more than anything else, or you just been shipping clerk for the longest time. Well, I mean, it's it's a pathway to get to that point. You know, it's it's understanding the whole operation. You know, if you became a master distiller and actually did not know any of the other parts of it, you'd really be an ineffective master distiller. You know, that's part of being a master distiller is overseeing and knowing what's happening, what's going on with the other parts. Mm -hmm. And you came in, uh, I'm assuming, I don't, I don't know your entire background here. Um, was it more like, um, apprenticeship that you learned all these things or did you have a a background formal education in science and chemistry and stuff like that too? It was more, I always call it a school of hard knocks, Mm -hmm. you know, that you learn from the ground up. It's not a formal education in a way, but in a way it is really a, a very formal education. You know, you learn, why you cook at a certain temperature, why you hold it for so long, you know, all the commercial or chemical parts of it become a reality when you understand why it's being done, you know, why the ferment, fermentation appears and reacts like it does. So, you know, it's all those parts that make everything come together to to reality. Mm-hmm. All right. One thing I gather from oh, you, one more thing about Steve, one thing I gather from you walking around and hanging out with you at lunch is that you have a unique ability to kind of keep everything basic and simple like you know just kind of is this is, is what it is you know it's let's do it the right way where did you get that from kind of that simple mindedness well that was from you know 47 years ago that's kind of the way uh, gas chromatographs all the the formal processes that are used to monitor now were not in existence i mean basically used a hydrometer a ph meter and, and a, a acid titration, and that told, you know, basically what are we doing now? We're making product that, that you can enjoy to drink. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what ends up, taste is what the final verdict is. All these other instruments, equipment, makes it refined enough that we can repeatedly do exactly what we need to do. So, you know, it, it's uh, collecting detailed information that, if a fermentation starts to go bad, we can look back on instruments and know exactly what's causing it. Where years ago we couldn't, we still had to rely on those three checks to to make sure that that was what was achieved. Gotcha. All right, Steve, we're gonna get you give you a give a break. You can have a drink of your Manhattan mm-hmm. over there. So we'll we'll focus on on John a little bit. So John, kind of kind of give us some background. Uh, you know, we talked at lunch from Missouri. Kind of what brought you into doing more stuff with spirits and i mean we talked about what got you here uh two years ago but what was that what was that initial thing that you said like i think this is this is what i want to do with my life so the main driver was uh working for pepsico um somebody from pepsico actually got hired onto sazerac and i got a call from him saying had really like to have you come down to one of our facilities in kentucky um, really help uh, revamp, increase process uh, efficiencies um, because in my previous job in PetsFico, my job really was um, a productivity manager for about 12 different co-manufacturing facilities under the PepsiCo umbrella in the greater Chicago area. Uh, so that was getting in, learning every position, uh, learning every single mechanical aspect of it, what really influences uh, different lines running, different speeds running, uh, unscheduled breakdown, scheduled breakdown, and really finding a balance, and then it increases increasing efficiencies across the board. So I came down to Kentucky. It took about six to seven months uh, to recruit me to come down here. Oh, yeah? I was comfortable where I was at. The Chicago but, and Louisville. But then I learned. I got, Chicago I, and Frankfurt, yeah. It's kind did of, my homework yeah. if I was going to go to a, a brand new industry. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, when I came down here, learned more uh, about the community, learned more about the industry. Um, it really struck my interest down here. And, and uh, my wife and I, at the time, made the decision to uproot our family 
and moved to Kentucky. And I got my feet wet at Barton 1792, starting out there as their quality manager and as their productivity manager for the site there. So looking at bottling line speeds, how to increase those, how to increase um, every efficiencies across that. the board. Yeah. yeah, doing time studies on everything. Um, you know, I came from a very lean background as far as white belt, green belt certification uh, and Lean Six Sigma, if you guys are aware of that. And so after we got bottling uh, up and running uh, to the speeds that we wanted to, my focus became the distillery over there. And then that's really uh, where my passion really got ignited in the spirits industry. And I, I went all in there at 1792. And then uh, an opportunity came to become a distiller, master distiller uh, down there. And um, like I said, I just put all my attention and focus uh, into that because my passion was driving that. And so that's where I initially got my feet wet. I uh, had a great time doing it. I still have a great time doing it. I'm just doing it here at the Barstown Bourbon Company now for the past two years. Well, what awesome. was that sales pitch? You know, he calls you up or, you know, they're like, come on over. And you're like, you know, we're this new startup. We promise it's going to be great. But, yeah, so you know, it, whereas you got that nice cushy job at 1792. So I did my homework also because uh, I had a great experience with Sazerac uh, under 1792. I wasn't looking to go to anywhere else. Um, well, like I said, I got a call from David Mandel. He's a very persuasive guy. And I don't think he's ever been told no before. Um, so it took about five or six months uh, for me to really do my homework, really research the company, uh, the people that are working her working here and everything. And like I said, that passion was even further ignited uh, with the business model here and the innovation that's taking place and the team they have assembled here uh, at the Barstown Bourbon Company. So that was what ultimately uh, really pushed me over the fence to, uh, to join the team here. What was that initial game plan or strategy? Like, obviously it's, as will people learn, you all have grown past that. But what was the initial, like, here are our goals just to kind of start out, you know, with the company and here's so, kind of the benchmarks we're trying to hit. But. Right. I think the initial goals and me and Steve talk about this. So initially we did plan to go up to 6 million proof gallons. We just thought it would take 10 years to get there. <laughs> uh, so not only did we surpass the 6 million, we're on track to do right at 7 million proof gallons this year. So we have increased efficiencies. We have quadrupled in capacity uh, since September 2016 at 1.5 million gallons. So what was originally probably a 10 to 12 year plan uh, quickly became under a two year plan. Uh, and only the people that we have assembled here is the only reason how we've been able to successfully do that. A lot of people brag about capital, what kind of equipment you have, uh, but the focus here is the human capital element here at the yeah. Barstown Bourbon Company. Company. Average years of experience you see out there on the floor just walking around is 15 years in a distillery. So every operator, supervisor, manager we have on the distillery side has worked at a distillery before. They were poaching all the all the yep. season people. That's what they were doing. They tend to do that in the bourbon industry. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to ask you uh, kind of a question about your PepsiCo days. Why is 7-Up so much better than Sprite? Um, it's just a personal. That's, uh, that's my thing. Yeah. I remember I, I could taste them side by side. I'm like, oh yeah, seven, up, seven up is way up, better. Up. So, so what's funny? I wasn't even on uh, the juice side of PepsiCo. I was on the light snacks food division. Oh, okay. Um, so my expertise, believe it or not, and this may be boring to some of your listeners, uh, was rice cakes, large rice cakes and small rice cakes. Oh boy. Uh, so if there was ever such thing as a master rice cake maker. Um, it, it would have been me and the PepsiCo <laughs> umbrella. That would so have been I, embroidered on your polo. Right. Yes. So I, I was on a team that helped uh, design and run over 500 uh, rice cake machines uh, out of Columbia, Missouri and Quaker Oats. Wow. wow. That was one of my first, first jobs under PepsiCo. That's did, they, uh, did they have a tent at Burn Beyond? You know, the, the rice cake tent? <laughs> the rice cake. I don't rice think we'll see them anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's go ahead and, and let's kind of talk about really what you all are doing and what you're building here uh, at, at Barstown Bourbon Company. Um, you know, Steve, you gave us a tour earlier and, and really showed us, um, A, like how things had changed in the past like year or two since it really started and you had... You had one still running 24-7. Now you have like two stills that are running 24-7. So kind of talk again about sort of the capacity and what you all have. Well, this business plan really started out opposite of what it is today. You know, we when we purchased the property, started laying out the, the facility, we were actually thinking of producing our product. That's Thus comes in the fact of 10 to 15 years of, of getting where we're at now. Well, during that process, we started talking to clients, potential clients, which are now clients, about doing custom production. 
And that grew by the time we started in 2016, we had actually sold out 100% of our capacity at 1.5 million proof gallons. So we went, started up, operated that year. The next June, we had enough uh, need to double. So that's when we went to 3 million proof gallons. Well, the next June, we needed to do that again, double again, thus going to 6.8 million proof gallons. 90% of that is driven by customer-based uh, collaborative distilling, you know, where we produce for other clients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that gives us cash flow, which enables us to expand the, the restaurant, bar, everything that you see here to make the, the complete. The vision of this is to develop and experience for people coming through, you know, more the Napa Valley type of experience, mm -hmm. not just having a tour, tasting, and then you're on your way. But also uh, the laws have changed in Kentucky to allow us to do that. So several things happened during that process during the two years that drove us from 1.5 million to three to 6.8 million proof gallons and developed the the visitor-based experience that we're getting ready to launch here in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. You said a nice, interesting thing about cash flow. You know, you, you get you said you all get paid in about two weeks after you produce it, whereas most companies have to wait four years, you know, to bottle right. it. And so, where I mean, did y'all just see a need? That net, that net 14? Exactly. <laughs> net 14. So, like, you know, MGP, you know, obviously everyone knows is like the big contract distiller. Did you all just say, they're the only ones doing there has to be a need somewhere or well, yeah, the need was there. So the need was for customized, not contract, really. Yeah. Uh, so customized meaning you have a say in every part of the process here um, with the help of Steve and I and the rest of the team. Um, so from grain selection, grain procurement, uh, for how we how we mill our grain uh, as far as the grind profile is concerned, mashing procedure, fermentation, what kind of yeast you want to use and how we want to run our two stills and our two 500-gallon doublers. Uh, so, and then what type of barrel we ultimately put it into and all the proofs, temperatures in between. So it is truly customizable. So we were the first to do that on such a scale where somebody like MGP had so many different recipes that they're selling out of inventory. Mm -hmm. Here we have pre-production meetings, uh, very specific pre-production meetings that we go over every part of the process with our customers. Uh, so just the things I mentioned, and not only that, they are welcome on site while we produce, and they are working side by side with our operators and producing their whiskey at, at our facility. And for the sensory part of it, we have to know what they want. So they actually come in and we work with them and we have to, we've even had customers come in and train us. And we, Steve and I, Nick Smith, our distillery manager, Travis Cantrell, who leads our lab, actually have to pass blind sensory panels to be able to even rate their product. Um, and then we have to score it numerically and write notes on every lot that leaves this facility. So it's very involved when we produce um, a product for our customers. Just It's just not saying, hey, we have inventory of these three mash bills. This is when they'll be available. Yeah. So it's, say it's, it's much more difficult than at Makers. And you're like, oh, we got one thing. Yeah. Here. I was going to say, right. Right. like coming from, you know, a Makers where you have one thing, you know, is this more of a pain in the ass? Like you're like, damn, I just wish we would produce one thing. But, you know. Put it in perspective, yeah. we're doing 41 mash bills right yeah. now this year. So that's two grain bourbons, three grain bourbons, four grain bourbons, rye whiskey, uh, malted uh, whiskey. We're, we just finished our first 100% single uh, uh, single malt recipe under the American uh, single malt category. So the innovation here is, is amazing. A lot of that, the success we're seeing is attributed to that human capital element I was seeing. So the cash flow helps us out uh, amazingly, but the human capital element where most most startups would struggle uh, to come as far along as we have in two, three years, um, we've we've had that human capital element that has really taken us to the next level uh, really quickly. So, so do most of your clients, do they have a mash bill in mind or do you guys kind of coach them through like, they're like, I want to do this. And you're like, wait a minute. That's you don't want to do that. It runs both ways. Some yeah. customers come in, they know exactly what they want. You know, we have to look at the, we want to produce a product they already have. So we're burdened with that responsibility. And that's where the tastings that John was talking about a while ago come into play. We learn to taste what they want. 
And, you know, it's, it might be something that I might say this needs to be adjusted a little bit, but it's their product. Mm-hmm. So that part of it comes in. And in addition to that, I mean, it's given us freedom to venture out and experiment some. You know, at Maker's Mark, I did everything exactly one way. Right. They had one recipe, one mash bill. Here we've actually put out a product that David knew nothing about until it was in the barrel. <laughs> and, you know, we have that ability and that freedom to, to do that. And that allows us to experiment some and to venture out. And that's what really drew me uh, first talking to David Mandel about that, the freedom of innovation here. And then that's just stopped me and Steve uh, have the freedom to innovate. It's down to the operator level. So they submit ideas uh, for new bourbons, new whiskeys, new blends. Is, so there, a, is there a suggestion box somewhere there, around here? Not only a suggestion box, but um, as far as their like annual performance, um, they are challenged with coming up with an innovation. Um, and they have, they have taken a hold of it and truly taken ownership of the process here and the innovation here. And we've seen some uh, great results because of that. Hmm. Let's walk me through the process. So Kenny and I, we want to come here and you, you know have us have you all produce our bourbon for us? What's like the first steps or what do we do? With the career as a master distiller spanning almost 50 years, as well as a Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Famer and having over 100 million people taste his products, Steve Nally is a legend of bourbon who for years made maker's mark with expertise and precision. His latest project is with Bardstown Bourbon Company, a state-of-the-art distillery in the heart of the bourbon capital of the world. They're known for their popular fusion series. However, they're adding something new in 2020 with a release named The Prisoner. It starts as a nine-year-old Tennessee bourbon that is then finished in The Prisoner Wine Company's French oak barrels for 18 months. The good news is, is you don't have to wait till next year to try it. Steve and the team at Bardstown Bourbon Company have teamed up with Rackhouse Whiskey Club. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Their December box features a full-size bottle of Bardstown's Fusion Series and a 200 milliliter bottle of The Prisoner. There's also some cool merch inside, and as always, with this membership, shipping is free. Get your hands on some early release Bardstown bourbon by signing up at RackhouseWhiskeyClub.com. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. Walk me through the process. So Kenny and I, we want to come here and you, you know have us have you all produce our bourbon for us. What's like the first steps or what do we do? Well, I mean, I, I know there's at least like 22 steps because we, <laughs> we saw the sheet with Steve earlier. It said literally everything. It said like in 10 minutes, it's going to sit here and then it moves over to something else. So it was, there's a lot. Follow the flow chart. Yeah, follow the flow chart. Well, yes. Sir. First, it's, uh, you know, you have a product that you want to replicate and either you've been buying on the open market, you know, just say you've been buying from MGP and it's a, a certain mash bill certain recipe well that's a starting point for us because we can pretty much find out what that is Mm -hmm. you know if it's a 21 percent rye we basically know what that is so then we start at that point and then we start to dial in what you want you know if the product you've been buying maybe is a little bit too hot a little bit too spicy or whatever it might be then we start to dial in to get that out of it and then we will work with you as a client to to get to that point and then you know we just take off from there what do you what are you dialing if something's too spicy just kind of give me an example there well there's lots of things you can do from the cooking process the grains you get in the the distillation you know temperatures that you run the condensers at for instance you can blow off certain uh, flavors by running your condenser at a higher temperature so it's dialing in little points like that can that can make a big difference in the product that you end up with but it's also some of our customers didn't have a mash bill in mind so uh, we really work with them they've been sourcing product they want to call Bardstown bourbon home uh, for their company so we really as the pre-production aspect of it we really narrow down do a lot of comparisons what they're looking for and then narrow down a mash bill since we 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 can afford to do that we have already so many mash bills in our pocket we can get pretty close to what they want off showing them the base distillates that we produce there we produce here and then from there we can um, really really narrow down from a process control aspect and really fine-tune the quality of the distillate that they're looking for so y'all were talking about yeast, you know, the caretaker of yeast or whatever you were doing earlier. So like, can, can you, 
fine tune it so much that you can pick your own yeast strains to do different things here, or is there only like one yeast strand here? Nope. So it's down to even yeast selection. So okay. we we handle dry activated yeast, liquid yeast. Right now we handle seven different yeast strands uh, here at this facility, and our customers really get to choose um, what type of profile yeast profile they're looking for, which drives the selection of the yeast that we utilize. Uh, when we inoculate each fermenter. So it is very interesting. A lot of work goes into yeast production. Like I said, that's why we leave it uh, to the pros and then we acquire, procure the yeast that we need to use uh, for each batch. Let's just take yeast as an example. I mean, hell, we're not going to know exactly which yeast strand we want, right? If we were going to go and contract a still. How do you guide somebody through a process like that? I mean, just using yeast as an example, so they... Maybe there's a type of yeast they have in mind. Maybe they have no idea. I mean, is there a way to sample different yeast strains and be able to say like, oh, yeah, that's that's the one. Here's I got, this mash bill with the seven different. Yeah, I've got, I get right. cherries out of this. So like I said, e- each yeast profile that uh, we can present or our customers present basically come with a congener profile, right? What they expect this distillate to taste like when utilizing this yeast. But like I said, we also have such a library of distillates now with different yeasts we can really show examples of, uh, it's not theoretical anymore, you're just not re- reading the description of what this yeast profile will lend to your fermentation process. They can actually taste in front of them, and you can have, let's, let's just use a 74-18-8 recipe, 74% corn, 18% rye, 8% malted barley. We have that with several different yeast strands in distillate form. So if I was using that as an example for a customer to try to nail down what type of yeast they use, I can take them through and have that same base mash bill, same base procedure that we use. And the only thing that we have changed is the is the yeast that we have inoculated those fermenters with. And they can taste each profile and see the difference, and they can select from there. Cool, cool. What about, so like, you, you got the distillation down. Now, what about the wood? Like, you know, do you guys guide them on which chars to use which type of woods you know type of barrels to use so in the spirit well. of collaboration um we use independent save company a lot but we work with seven eight different cooperages also so we get those cooperages involved when we're talking with our customers it's just not telling our opinion on stuff we get um the grain uh suppliers we get the farmers we get the cooperages uh, we get the the experts in each of those individual fields to come in and talk to our customers also so it's really collaborative group effort when we're designing a first production here for a customer cool cool yeah i was about to say i was like there's a lot going on there um because i would imagine like you guys are you're running at capacity right now right i mean you would correct yeah i mean you're you're contracted out for pretty much uh pretty much everywhere so it's not like Anybody's going to come in tomorrow and be like, hey, ready for 300 barrels or whatever it is, right? Yeah, how long is that wait? <laughs> right now we have contracts, some of them out as, as far out as seven or eight years. But we're pretty much contracted out almost full capacity for the next three years, three to five years. You know, there's some space here and there, but yeah. not a lot. We intentionally leave some space uh, for new customers. I mean, we just don't do, we don't do investment barrels. We don't just have somebody come up new to the industry wanting barrels you have to be vetted you have to be established you have to be an established brand so we want to know this partnership uh when you're partnering with bardstown bourbon in this collaborative effort uh that it's a a true collaboration in in the spirit uh, of collaboration and the brand that we're working with i mean it's amazing that you can pick and choose your customers (laughs) yeah well and the demand is out there i mean there's never a week goes by that we don't have multiple people come in wanting to get on the list you know to have product produced for them so the demand the need is still out there but as you said we get to pick the clients that work best for us that we can do the best job for so is there an opportunity if say you have you know barrels that are aging right now for someone to buy like you know a certain amount off of those lots or is that are you trying to say are you trying to say we need to source some here in like five years asking (laughs) i'd say if somebody's interested in something like that reach out to us and we'll definitely talk to you about it. Um, We have, like, it's truly, we're transparent and we will tell you, uh, especially in uh, that effort, if we have, if we produce 300, we had higher yields, 310, 315, are there was available two or three years? Come to uh, talk to us and we're more than open to talk to you about something like that. Cool. Put our name, put our name first on the list. Yeah. So I want to talk about, (laughs) so you got your wood selection now, aging. Um, You all have some beautiful warehouses here. So, how do you go about like allocating the floor levels 
to your individual clients, you know. So like, question, say I like I really want the first floor because I want to let it sit there forever. But somebody else wants the hot, top floor. How do you kind of give uh, allocation to those customers? The allocation stems from basically where we're at and how we fill our warehouses um, and what, what type of brand uh, that we're producing for um, at the moment. Uh, so we really don't rotate here. Um, but like I said, we're open to anything. So if you're doing a minimum 300 Steve's used barrel to rotating run, barrels. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and we kind of do on first come, first serve. And we're filling the warehouses so fast that if you come in and there's only one floor left to put it on, that's you the one know, you're getting. That's the one yeah. you get. But if there's space available and you want it on the first floor, yes, we'll do that. Gotcha. So it's just kind of a first it, Do they make those, you know, they, some, those demands, like I want them on this floor or that Some floor. do. So some I can tell you, working with 24 different customers or 40 mash bills, we have probably seen every demand that you could think possible <laughs> yeah. uh, for producing bourbon or whiskey for somebody else. What's the craziest demand? Oh, gosh. Steve, do you want to answer that one? Probably use something exotic besides the cereal grain, which mm -hmm. we won't do. <laughs> <laughs> exotic or introduce some other thing in the distillation column as we're distilling a yeah. beer to try to mingle in the distillation column. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty, pretty unique. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and we, we don't say no. We, we, we look at every request, think it through, because those type of requests can really drive innovation, believe yeah. it or not. So we're very open. So we get to work with all these different technical teams. So we work for some of the largest craft producers in the world to the some of the top five spirits producers in the world. So with that comes distilleries that have been around a very long time, companies that have been around a very long time that have technical teams. So not only do we get to leverage our key operators and their experience as 15 years in the business, we get to leverage different companies, teams when uh, they come and look at our our assets, how we run stuff, and we get to know how they run stuff also. Yeah. So there's a huge, huge knowledge transfer there. I want to talk about the economies of scale, I guess. If I'm a brand that's established, why is it more beneficial to me to have a contract distiller versus just open it my own? Like, where's the kind of break even or like where... Or I guess there probably is an eye break even. That's why they continue to contract. Yeah, that's a good question. So this, this bourbon uh, boom that we're in right now, a lot of people don't doesn't know when it's going to end. A lot of people have their opinions. Is it going to be two more years, three more years? So it's from a capital investment standpoint and a cash flow uh, standpoint. Do they want to build a new distillery? Do they want to expand? Do they want to spend millions of dollars? Or do they want to supplement uh, their demand in the short term with um, a company like us? Or do they... They just want to work from a collaborative standpoint, how transparent we are, and lean on our knowledge to help them out in that certain situation. So there's tons of different situa situations why uh, people come produce for us instead of starting their um, own distillery or um, increasing their capacity at their current locations. So One it's thing I've seen, neat. too, is that you know somebody wants to start up a brand. Maybe they have a brand. They want to build a distillery. Well, maybe they have the capital to build the distillery and start, but they don't have the capital to sustain that three, five, ten-year wait mm -hmm. to get a product. Or if they come and produce for us, they don't have this overhead to investment to, to really get into it that way. They can pay for the product produced and keep going. So that's that's been a large point, and I think that's a large uh, issue with micro distilleries starting up. You know, some of them cannot sustain that that long term. Yeah. So you talked about what you can do for other people. What have you all been doing yourselves for yourselves here? That's a that's a great question. We continue to think about that on a daily basis, actually. Um, so we have several core different mash bills. We have a 20% wheat, a 39% wheated bourbon, 54% malted whiskey, 95.5 rye whiskey, 30%, 36% rye bourbon. And then on the experimental category, um, we have a handful, numerous experiments on the mash bill category. We're actually doing a 90% corn uh, corn bourbon, believe it or not. So we, we've 90% heirloom corn, 10% malted barley, and we've put it into a new charred, uh, charred oak number four barrel. Uh, that was our most recent experiment, experiment along with the American single malt experiment. So we're doing a lot of experimentation. A lot goes into our experiments because our smallest batch we make here is a 30 barrel batch. So we need to do our homework before um, we do, Don't screw we that do our experiments. Yeah. yeah. So if we're, we're, we're paying for 400, let's say 425 bushels at a 30 gallon beer, 
um, there's a lot of grain, roughly, roughly, uh, exactly 23,800 pounds of grain uh, in that uh, experiment that goes into there. So we got to do a lot of our homework. The innovation, like I said, is ongoing every day, just not on uh, mash bill selection, but how we run the equipment, what type of equipment, how we blend. We really work with our culinary and beverage teams. Uh, we utilize what we have, what you see in front of us, to help us on our blending side and new product development uh, side also. So it's one of the things I'm passionate about here is the innovation side of it mm -hmm. and the freedom to innovate. We're just not making one mash bill. Yeah. We're, we're, we're making several mash bills a day. We have 32 fermenters on site. 12,500 gallons of fermenter, and sometimes we can have four to five recipes uh, sprawled out ac across that production floor. So. so you got options. We have options. <laughs> and to go a little farther than that, you know, just if we do one recipe, and we've done this, uh, aging, you know, there's been some conversation I've heard over the years that, you know, bourbon ages better at a certain proof in the barrel. Well, we've, we, we have that experiment in process now. We've put the same production in at... 107, 110, 115, 120, 125, just to prove to ourselves more than anything, it does age better at this proof rather than a higher proof or a lower proof. So things like that is what we're able to do on a daily basis. And to Steve's point, we even, we're down to blending distillates before we put it into the barrel. So uh, blending different mash bills in distillate form, then putting it into the barrel just for for the innovation, uh, see what happens. And then likewise, to Steve's point, the 100, 105, 107, 110, 110, 115, 125 entry proofs of the same exact mash bill on the same exact run that we can blend on the backside after their, um, their age for 10 to 15 years on that, that particular recipe. So what's your, what's your level of confidence? Because I, I think about it from a business perspective. I'm like, shit, that's a lot of risk, <laughs> right? Like, let's, like, I would be like, let's focus on something that we know that we can sell like it's 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 basically like this is what we can account for right so talk about like the level of risk you're willing to assume with all these as well right uh, so the, yeah go ahead steve i don't know that it's a huge risk or at least our thinking is if you put a good quality product in the barrel to start with it's not going to be bad you know maybe it's going to taste a little different i mean maybe it'll be a a thousand dollar bottle product comes out mm -hmm. instead of a fifty dollar bottle product. So please just let me yeah. try it here at the tasting bar. <laughs> but you know, it's it's the thought that we can do something with it because it's going to be good no matter what. And so very methodical, all the pre work that goes into all these innovations. So for every let's say new mash bill that we produce. There's about 40 to 50 mash bills that we are not producing yeah. is how we got to that one. So it's that pre-production aspect, doing our homework. Uh, so I, I, I'd say back to the knowledge that this facility possesses across the board really hedges that risk um, of producing something that would not be worthy uh, of having the Bardstown bourbon name on it. Mm -hmm. So we, we're, really, we're really excited and we're really proud even in an experimental form with what we produce on the innovation side. So, you know, you had mentioned earlier, earlier, Steve, or sorry, John, about, um, you know, kind of looking at the market and really how everything is just continuing to grow. So, Steve, I got a question for you. Are you keeping your pulse on, on bourbon and like kind of where do you see this path in three years, five years, 10 years? Is there is there a bubble that's going to burst? I've seen the downturn on bourbon. I was in the industry when it took the big dive. And companies were thinking they were going to have to close the doors. There were no uh, podcasters back then. You yeah. weren't broadcast. Well, <laughs> it, it was in smoke signals. But anyway. Uh, so, Steve, or, can I bring up something real quick? Hilarious. Yeah. So, I give Steve, um, we go back and forth. Uh, me and Steve have a great friendship. But I like to remind them, we have an antique collection here on site, right? Yep. There's a bottle on there that Steve has produced Was that is bottle. now <laughs> in an antique collection here at the facility. Wow, that's so awesome. I always give that's, him grief. He usually tells me to shut up when I say that. I can't so. say that on there, can I? <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> say whatever you want. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, the bottle keeps going empty, and I don't understand that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, the the what we're doing now with the, the demand increasing daily – uh, with the marketplace like it is, unless something drastic happens, I don't think we will see at least a downfall. We might see a leveling off where it'll plateau out, but I don't think we in our lifetimes will see it downtrend like it has in the past. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think it would be like this? 
not this fast. I thought it would come back, but I didn't think it would be this fast. But it's just took a, uh, it's taken off where it's just skyrocketing right now. And, you know, if, if markets keep opening up, especially overseas, you know, we're never going to be able to meet the demand. Yeah. Where are you, cool. John? I'm pretty much in the same boat as that. I, I think if we do see a downturn, it's going to be the established brands and distilleries uh, that are going to survive it. So when when that happens, I, my opinion is I don't know. So if you do know, let me know because I'm also the planner here and I can plan our forecast accordingly. Uh, but until then, uh, we are we're, we're driving we're driving forward 110 percent. Like Steve said, if we get into basically the Asian markets, uh, India, China, I mean, there's not enough bourbon in the U.S. to satisfy those yeah. markets. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's uh, if we think about like what Heaven Hill did during that time, like they acquired, they, they basically branched out, right? They were acquiring vodkas and uh, other types of spirits. Are you all thinking like, hey, like, we, let's do a rum here. Let's do whatever it is. Like, are you thinking of something beyond just whiskey? I don't think Steve, am, am I burning your ears there? Is it too uh, much? To- kind of, sort of, but uh, <laughs> I don't think there's any interest in it right now because we're maxed out at the bourbon and whiskey at you know categories so you know, as far as venturing off into a, a gin or a rum or vodka or something uh, i really can't see a point to it you know we just don't have the ability or the capacity to do it right and our core strategy right now is uh whiskey and bourbon so we do not have plans to produce a, a gin or a vodka at this facility uh even as a startup that's probably uh surprising for a lot of people mm-hmm. uh for cash flow purposes a lot of new distillery startups come out with vodkas and gins and that's their strategy their business plan our plan and core focus is going to be on uh bourbon and whiskey it was funny we were up there and there was a spreadsheet and Steve was like, "This is a slow day," and uh, I was like, "What well, a lot of different colors!" I was like every it, huh? time yeah. slides full, Steve. I'm like, what's a busy day like? <laughs> and so, busy days when there's ten colors up there. Yeah, and so yeah, you can totally see that yard just booming right now. I mean, it's crazy mm-hmm. in the short amount of time. Oh, for sure. And you know, as we kind of like want to talk about like last on like the operation side of things, you know, as we had kind of mentioned. We saw that list of like the the 20 some odd steps that you get to customize as you're going through there. Like whose idea was it to sit there and say like, instead of maybe just saying like, oh, choose your grain bill, we'll we'll take care of the rest. Like what part was it that said we should probably have them be a part of this every step of the journey? Well, when we started the, the thought process of custom production, you know, it was to produce the brand that you have or that you want to put out. So in order for us to be able to do that, we've got to know your thoughts. So all that comes into play of, of grain selection, cook temperatures, you know, proportion uh, percentages of grain, yeast, any part of it, you know, you've got to have a say in it. If you don't, then it's not really your product. You know, you've been doing that over the years. You've been buying product that you had no say in. So it's not really customized unless you have input on mm-hmm. everything. And the list just kind of grew out of those conversations. Is it just like template at that point to say like, hey, these are our, these are our twenty steps. Like you choose whichever you want in this step. It's it's really that 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 pre production homework that, I, that that I brought up a couple times. We really go through each step of the process. Some of our customers like a fifteen minute hold. Some like a twenty minute hold. What, some okay, like to cook on. up to one eighty. What's, what's a hold? Uh, so that, to get the enzymes active and basically to get your long chain starch molecules uh, down to a fermentable sugar, uh, which is your glucose, maltose, maltriose. Uh, so it's really to break down those starches into sugars. Uh, so uh, to put it in terms that everybody will understand, no, it's we, a like, rest we, like, period. we like the whiskey geek stuff. Yeah, it's, it, like. it's a rest period for the enzymes to do their job. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of people have different schools of thoughts and depending on what enzymes you use, um, that really dictates how long some of those holds and some of those temperatures are. And I'm assuming so the it, holds are going to affect the flavor at the end of this as well. It's a cook temperature that you reach a temperature and you hold it at that temperature. I mean, it's, it's similar to cooking a food. You know, you, you boil it for so long to break it down. So in the hold, we hold it so long to break that starch down. So and that, also that to pasteurize it on, on most recipes uh, to kill all the bacteria uh, in, in the process because sanitation 
uh, is key in, in this industry and in this process, as you guys know. You know what this reminds me of is a home renovation. You know, like having to pick all the, you know, you got to do the cabinets, the knobs, right. the, the molding. It's like a ton right. of decisions. And we couldn't do all this without yeah. the flexible system that we've really implemented here. So if, if you were here three years ago or uh, approaching three years ago in September, um, the whole system has really uh, evolved also. So we're really trying to balance the art and science uh, of this process. So this last shutdown, we just installed a new mash cooler. We just installed a whole new process control system where we can basically, it has a historian module on it. We can really look at every part of the process any given t time of the day anywhere in the world. That's all. If we wanted to. And uh, we're going to allow our customers to be able to look at that process. If they're not here on site, they'll be able to log in and see how our cookers are doing, how our stills are doing. So, and it, it's great. It's flexible across departments too. It does all of our cost accounting. Um, it does all of our work in progress. So everybody can see how much raw materials we have in the process uh, with the cost associated with it too. So I can get down to which operators on which station and there's a DVR function to where I can see what buttons were pressed. Uh, so we mine a lot of mine a lot of data here, uh, but that's easy. It's easy to mine a lot of data. The hard part is pulling the data out um, and really understanding what it does. So this particular software system has an AI functionality to it. So it can actually watch what we fix on the screen. If we put something in a manual and bring it down, it can learn next time. It has uh, indicators for next time. Hey, it, the system's about to do this. It'll auto-correct no. itself. So you can manage what you measure, you know. Exactly. Or, yep. I was about to say it's almost like a like a Domino's thing. Like, oh, like Jerry just rolled your dough and right. Now but Sarah, we're not getting fully Sarah, automated. Sarah's automated. We really want to lean on the human capital element again. So we haven't, as as you saw, as you walk through, they're still turning valves. There's still definitely a human element into it, and that's what I'm talking about—the art and science. We really want to balance that uh, because there's pros and cons to both. So. so what about bottling? Do you guys bottle here yet, or or do you help with packaging at all, or? So I. I think we can say this, right? We're getting ready to yeah. um, uh, build a, a bottling facility here and break ground in the next few months. Mm -hmm. So we'll have some high-speed lines and a specialty line uh, in that bottling hall, which will be here on site. And we're going to make that just just as transparent and just as great as exper experience that you have on the distilling side. We're going we're gonna to offer that on the bottling so side also. So it's like a true concierge here. You it's, can, it, it's you can true. Do everything. It's true from beginning to end. We will be able to do it all here for you. You can even yep. go pick your own corn outside if you wanted to. Yep. It's like the yeah. Ritz Carlton here. You know, I don't they, know what you'll they do. They do whatever you, you want. You can <laughs> feel free to. <laughs> they'll, they'll give you lunches and cocktails. You know, it's it's great. Speaking Perfect. of, it takes me about a day to grind all that corn that's out there. So it's about a day of production uh, for us. So about for 10 our listeners, what, corn. What, what, how, how, what size is that out there? So we probably have 35, 35 yeah. acres uh, of corn out there right now. And you run so through that in a day? We'll run through that. That's a little over a day. On average, 26, 27 acres uh, that we process through this facility right now. Wow. Just, it just goes and, and you think about it. I mean, this just the industry in general, right? How much corn goes through. I mean, for, for myself, I, I, I always have... Uh, a thing when I think about chickens, like how much, how much like chickens are actually consumed on a daily basis between chicken nuggets, between eggs, between everything like that. Like it's the same reason in bourbon. Like there's, there's so much corn that is actually produced and actually goes in this product. Like, we even have one of our operators growing 40 acres for us. Uh, so Matthew Osborne, who's on our warehouse team has grown 40 acres of bloody butcher heirloom corn for us. And, um, he's sending pictures, um, uh, that's the ownership piece I was talking about. This corn is now 15 foot tall out of his property. Wow. Um, and, and it looks beautiful. And he's personally responsible for uh, planting the seeds, growing it, taking care of it, and delivering it to our site. So that's that ownership aspect. Uh, everybody you see uh, uh, walking around here is thoroughly involved in the process. Hopefully he gets a barrel out of it. He will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's go ahead. We'll, we'll wrap this up. You know, Steve and John, it was a pleasure having you all on, uh, especially because, you know, we had, we've had we had Dave on uh, way back in episode 19, and now we get to really kind of hear, like, the operation side of this, uh, especially because back then, you know, we this place didn't even exist, it was right? A dream. Yeah. yeah, it really was. And so being able to kind of understand exactly the journey that that each of you have come through in your own personal and professional lives, and and kind of giving that that sort of touch of personality to our listeners as well is uh, very appreciative because really that's how that's how people connect. That's what they want to really understand of of who these people are that are actually producing a lot of the products that 
they're going to start seeing on the shelves here in a few years. So right. thank you again for, for yeah. coming on here. Kenny Ryan, thanks for, thanks thanks for, for having us. us. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate. Thanks for having us from being such gracious hosts. Yeah. I mean, I gosh, know. I know. Y'all treat us like kings here. It's Maybe we'll go see a warehouse after right. this. Maybe. We All can right. do that. So uh, make sure that you, you can follow Bartown Bourbon Company on uh, Facebook and Instagram and all those good places. You can follow us as well, Bourbon Pursuit, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you like what you hear, we always appreciate your support. Uh, leave us a review if you haven't done that. Yeah. Go ahead and do that. Just just go ahead, open up the your whatever kind of podcast app they're using, write us a review. We we always appreciate we it. We like good and bad ones. That's we true. Like, we like to know when we suck. That's so. what uh, <laughs> it said. Uh, I think I heard a quote that nobody gets better by hearing always good feedback. Exactly. Right. So, right. Uh, so make sure we you can, can take it. You can always send us an email to, uh, you know, team at bourbon pursuit but ryan go ahead and close this out yeah if anyone has show suggestions comments feedback like kenny said we love hearing from you guys because this is who we do it for so yeah with that guys thanks again um being from bardstown you know this is like a really barstown bourbon company has been a breath of fresh air to the community like with the restaurant and just everything you guys are doing it's so innovative and cool and, and i'm excited to you're, you're one of kind of the, one of the people, first people to make that step, you know, towards what we're trying to achieve here in this town. So I appreciate everything y'all are doing. And uh, yeah, with that, we'll see you next time.